And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. Woo! I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of the action movie RPG known as The Underground. The one and only uh, Julian Costa. How are you doing today, man? Hello. I'm doing. I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing great, in fact. Mm -hmm. Anything upwards of good? That's what I'm doing. Yep. So, a bit of a tradition around here is opening with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Oh my God, role-playing games in general. Jesus. Um. Okay, I guess I, I guess it doesn't go that far back. Uh, so I started like maybe I want to say sophomore year of of high school. Uh, but I I had known about D and D for like a while before then. Um, specifically, it was because I started watching a lot of um actual plays. Mm -hmm. The first actual play I watched is the one that the the dudes from Team Four Star did. Uh, the the ones who did the Dragon Ball Z Bridge, they had mm -hmm. this actual play on like their gaming channel, mm -hmm. uh, and I was like, "Wow, this is cool." Um, and then I bothered my friends into playing until they played D and D with me, uh, and that was how it started. And now I've played a bunch of other games. Basically, that's kind of how the story goes. It was D&D, and then I played a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, and I'm making my own. Yep. Now, the underground, you describe it as being built on a, a lot of um, action movie cliches. Um, yeah. You've, you've cited John Wick, Fast, Fast and the Furious, Terminator, Matrix, The Equalizer... Would it be fair to say you're you're basically going for that um that ex that exaggerated hi hyper real as the, as the term has been used in the last few years? Um, that's kind of, that's kind of what you're going for as far as what style of action movie it's trying to be. Um, it's actually a little bit less specific because it's I've come to realize that it's not really like the game itself is is a mix of those, but like you can make your character into any one of those like molds cuz like you can make a John Wick um if you have like certain stats in like the the more acrobatic gun uh gun fu type stuff but like also you can make a character that can just be shot and like shrug it off and that's sort of like the fast and furious stuff right mm -hmm. like dude's just not caring about that uh but yeah it's it's sort of like you can fine tune your experience to fit um any action movie you like, I think. Uh, there's a lot of room to, like, just tailor the game into basically anything you want. Uh, as, long, as long as it's still, like, a somewhat, a somewhat semi-modern action movie. Yeah, I can, I can certainly get that. Now, I think, I think what I was trying, I think what I was trying to nail down is what the Appendix N was for The Underground, because that's, that's all. That's always. That's always important. People who design games always want to have. Always want to have a certain, for lack of a better term, fantasy that they wish to fulfill within their. Game. Oh yeah. Oh. It was definitely, like, very. It was. Very early on, and I think even now it was very much John Wick. Like leaning, because that that was the movie that inspired the, this game to be made. Hmm. Um, it's. Uh, like, you could probably tell in, like, how I describe the idea of the system on the Kickstarter page, you know? It's like, ooh, there's all these spooky, secretive people, and they have these secret plans, and they're, and you're slowly moving up the, the sort of totem, the hierarchy of it, right? Um, so that was sort of the, the initial inspiration. Mm -hmm. Um, John, uh, it's, it's gone further than that, obviously, but that was definitely, um, the focus. I think you can make a very good John Wick, if, if you're playing a character. 
I, I can see the argument that, like, mathematically, that might be the <laughs> the smartest way to go at this current point in the playtesting stage. Yeah. Yeah, and the uh, the big reason why I why I got on that is, um, obviously, there's a lot of there, there's a lot of directions that one can go in in terms of doing the whole a the whole action movie thing. I mean, on one hand, you have the you have some of the neo noir stylings that you have with John Wick, and on the other hand, you have the ridiculousness that ha that happens whenever Michael Bay is doing something other than Transformers. You know, yeah, when he's yeah, doing something good. I think it's very funny because you're gonna have a character that you imagine as a very grim John Wick, who's like, um, <laughs> you know, having the having the the absolute time of his life getting the snot beaten out of him by the enemies. And then you have a character who <laughs> is doing these just ridiculous mechanical things that amount to just things blow up around me. That's just how it happens to be. Uh, but yeah, it's it's fun to allow. Because to me, it's like... um The, the thing that, that draws me in about D&D is that um, people could have made kind of whatever game they wanted around it, you know? Um, and that's kind of what I want any game I make to be. Like, there's this central theme, of course, but uh, everything I say about it is, like, with an asterisk of, like, saying, please change it, you know, if you want. If you feel like you want to change it, then please do. Go ahead. You know? Yeah, and that's that's the way it re it really should it really should be. There there isn't some right way to play, some right way to role play. It's a case of as I often tell people, um, this is this is not a Lego playset where you're following the directions. This is the blue bucket, and you're just freestyling. Yeah, yeah. I'd probably argue there's a little bit more form, but I d I do agree with that. Well, there, there's. There is there is some form because obviously you can't fit every part onto e onto each other when building Legos. Yeah. Uh, but the framing device that you use is the idea of the underground being this. Um, you called it a Byzantine criminal organization represented by yes. employers. Um. With. What pro what prompted that as the framing device to build the underground around? Uh, so it the the main setting of the underground that I use, which is sort of vague because I give you the feeling of 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 what the setting is like, but I'm encouraging you to like make your own characters and stuff. Is that uh, it works best with like the intended mechan mechanical flow of the game. So that intended mechanical flow is that there's like a mission on one day, uh, and then there's like these days of of downtime mm. um, that uh, are basically used for like standard. Uh, it could be role playing, but like mechanically, it's stuff that is like you're you're getting more skills, upgrading your abilities, your traits, stuff like that, and then you go and do another mission. Uh, so the so the idea is that um, the employers all have access to different stuff. So like every ability, trait, skill, piece of equipment, everything has like one of the employer types assigned to it. Uh, which means basic. The idea is that when you go to get this done, you have to interact with that employer. Mm -hmm. So so. To go to the guy to get your um, like, I don't know, sniper skills up. You go to the guy that is good with snipers, who is probably like an arms dealer or something, in the system, and you have to talk to him, and he might ask for favors. It's like an opportunity for interacting with these these characters during the game. Um, and then there's of course the aspects of like maybe you're going to betray them at some point. Maybe you're going to take over their side of the industry. Uh, it's all about the, I guess, inner, it's, it's all about having the game work well with the, the story that you want to tell. So my goal is to have, like, I guess, like, a good, 
good building blocks for the story of uh, of what you could tell in the underground. And be like, hey, if you want to make a cool campaign idea or a series, as we call it, in the underground, uh, this is th- this is this is what we have for you. Go crazy, yeah, kind of thing. Uh, I- and we hope this works out well. I can I can certainly get that. Now, you meant it. It mentions one about bre- about um, breaking the rules of the system. That yeah. that carries an implication that you want you want people to come up with um, crazy crazy ass builds and co- and combinations within the um, character creation sandbox. Is that I accurate? Do. Yeah, I definitely do. Um, because like that is the most. Because how the game works is that like there's no classes. If you meet the prerequisites for uh, an ability or trait, which is very basic, you need to have a certain high enough bonus in that uh, in that stat. Like you just get it. And so uh, the normal game, like the 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 normal balance that I have planned, is that like you get two really high bonuses. And then you make one bonus higher and higher and higher until you get to the max level. But uh, with that framework, there's a lot of potential uh, for people to make some freaky builds. Uh, you know, do some freaky stuff. And I, it's already happened in the playtest. People have made freaky builds. Mm-hmm. And it's there's a point where like you have to wonder. Do I do I get rid of this possibility or do I embrace it? And I've decided to mostly embrace it. To, to, which, to be clear, does not mean that there's like a secret kill every enemy instantly mode that you can play in the game. I, I want to make that clear. But just weird ideas that you may have about weird character traits and being really good at like specific weird things. That is definitely a part of the game. Mm-hmm. It's definitely a part of the game to uh, like... I imagine there'll be a lot of competitions among tables to, like, find who can make the single attack with the highest amount of damage. Or, I don't know, who can go the most distance in movement speed in in one turn. That kind of stuff. Yeah. And with that in mind, since you mentioned the bonuses, um, I'd like to play a bit bit of word association with, with you, if you don't mind. Okay. So, I'm gonna go through the list of the list of bonus types, and I'd like you to list off a character who you think would be a good representative of someone who'd be high in that. Whether that be a character, a character from a film, a, sh- a show. There's nothing off the table when it comes to this. Yes, I've done this many times in my own head. So, all right, I'm ready. <laughs> Muscle. Uh, that would probably be Dom Toretto from Fast and Furious. Uh, he also counts for spine, but I don't have a better example right now. Um, well, unfor- unfortunately, say- you don't have a you don't have a family bonus. <laughs> That's true. Um, but the reason why Dom Toretto is just because um, he has this. Uh, he just lives like through things, mm. and he did this thing in one movie. Literally, the first night that the first time that the underground was ever played like, two years ago, when this was still just an idea in my head. Uh, I watched Fast and the Furious with my friends, and he did this thing uh, it, during one of the movies where he went completely horizontal midair and headbutted somebody and instantly knocked them out. Mm-hmm. And that, that inspired a uh, an underground ability, like, a trump card ability in the underground. Like, that is... <laughs> like, he... Dom Toretto is a very big inspiration for the muscle build, just because he... He pushes people through buildings and destroys them and picks up big objects and smashes them on people and is just a ver- very much a tank when he's not driving. Because when he's driving, he's a whole different character, you know? Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, he becomes this crafty, brilliant person, which I think is very fun. Uh, but yeah, I would definitely say Don Toretto. Yeah, I can get that. Um, spine. Okay, Spine... This is gonna be uh, a weird, a weird one, uh, which is which is because I don't actually have as much interaction with this character as I as I would like to. But John Shaft, uh, which is sort of like this old detective character, because um, Spine is like 
it's kind of a bonus that, like, I could tell you that it's like, oh, yes, it's about damage resistance, but also it's like, you're just cool. Like, it's your cool meter. It's how cool you look when you're doing things. And this dude is very, is very cool. Um, granted, he has never been shot and been fine, which is sort of a, which is sort of a part of, of having spine, but, like, he just, he just carries it. You know, he's fine. He's just, he's just cool enough to deserve the title of, of the high spine character. I feel like the the word you're looking for is unflappable. Mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, but ne- next would be hand. Hand. That's John Wick. That's John Wick, 100%. Um, yeah, he... <laughs> I feel like there's almost nothing, nothing more to say. It's John Wick, uh, the person who reloads fast, who... Uh, is able to make any th- any small thing into a weapon, you know, random Krav Maga, uh, unarmed stuff, shooting really fast. This is this is all what hand is. Hmm. Um. Uh, the brain. All right, brain is a is a little bit different because there's a lot of characters who have brain. Um, but not all of them, uh, are, like, full into it. I only know of side characters who are, like, brain, which is, which is tough to say. I will say one thing. James Bond needs to be a very, a very high brain character. Actually, no, I'm going to take back what I just said. It's James Bond. Brain is mm-hmm. James Bond. I completely forgot about the gadget thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, brain has, um, there was an item in the, in the full game called a gadget, and the gadget is just like a vague item that has like three different uses, but you can buy more abilities and traits with brain, and the gadget just does like crazy things. And the vast majority of what those abilities are inspired by are, are James Bond movies, as you could imagine. So yeah, it's it's mostly James Bond. <laughs> mm-hmm. So. Next would be the tongue. Tongue, yeah. Um, there was a movie that recently came out. It's called The Man from Toronto. Uh, and it features uh, an actor that I don't remember the name of, which is the man from, the to- from, which is a man from Toronto. And he's like a super badass assassin, right? Mm-hmm. And then also Chris Rock is in the movie. Uh, and Chris Rock, he, he makes quips. And he's funny, and somehow he finds himself to be useful uh, in this situation, and that and that is what tongue is. Um, he's good at talking, and he's and the character is like funny, if you can imagine. Mm-hmm. They don't have much business being there, <laughs> if I'm being honest. But like somehow it just works out, you know, the things they say, the things they do, the ideas they have, mm-hmm. even if it's a little bit slapstick, ends up being being well being well crafted, you know, ends up helping the team somehow. Mhm. And the last one is eyes and ears. Yeah, um There are actually two characters that come to mind because eyes and ears is pretty expansive. Uh the American sniper, mhm, because he is a sniper and also uh and uh Rambo. Uh and Rambo because uh, obviously he obviously he's very strong, and he would probably have a significant amount of muscle in him as well. Um, but he uses a bow and arrow. He's stealthy, blends in with the environment. Uh, he's clever, precise. Uh, that is very much a part of the eyes and ears uh, bonus. Mm-hmm. Stealth is a part of it. Yeah. Yeah. So. I suppose. I suppose. When you say when you say Rambo, I'm, assu- I'm assuming you're re- you're referring to Rambo specifically in um, First Blood. I yeah, I would think so, because he doesn't really. Well, he kind of. It's it's hard to say. He he comes in and out of the of the very stealthy. Environmental kind of. Yeah, it's just hiding first, thing. First Blood doubles down on the on that um unconventional warfare appro- approach 
um, more than say First Blood Part Two or Rambo Three yeah. does. Yeah, I would definitely agree. Um, so yeah, Rambo First Blood definitely has uh, that eyes and ears aspect in it. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also imagine any ninja you've ever seen in your entire life being an eyes and ears character. Uh, should it, should we throw in Snake Plissken as well? Oh, uh, who is Snake Plissken? I don't remember at the moment. Escape from New York. Hold on. I think I think you could. I think it could. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Also, um. Well, that that that's just I. I was gonna I was gonna bring up a, a character from a TV show I was watching as an Eisenhower's character as well, mm -hmm. but that was just because he used a sniper once. Yeah. And in that, in my and in my mind, that makes you an automatic Eisenhower's character. Oh. Uh, so that works. Although there are some historical figures I think who could who could fit well in some of the um, bonuses the way you've described them, especially especially since the bonuses are not. They're the they're the equivalent of attributes in other games, but not in but not but in terms of actual practice, not as much from what I'm seeing. But um, one of them is Sim one of the ones that's coming to mind is Simo Hyaha, and I'm pretty sure I mispronounced it because it's Finnish, um, also known as the White Death. He would be oh yeah, that's the person that that got a whole lot of kills during the Winter, War, right? Yeah, got got a shit got a shit ton. Um, Whole whole battalions were sent to try and f to try and find him. Yeah, 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 definitely. And um, as far as as far as muscle, um, the legend of Imo Koivinen, uh, the the legend of Imo Koivinen would probably either be muscle or spine. <laughs> oh yeah, Rasputin I think would uh would probably be spine. I think. Because because of how hard it took for them to actually kill yeah, him. Yeah, that's that's it. That's it. That's the only thing. <laughs> oh, well. Are you familiar with the legend of Imo Koivinen? Um, I probably would if you reminded me of it. That sounds familiar. He, he was he was also a soldier in the Winter War. Um, he um, he ended he ended up ski he ended up skiing to try and because his unit was trying to avoid some russians that were pursuing him he needed a boost so he took so he he took um per he took the per the pervitin that had been supplied to his unit and pervitin was used as a stimulant around that time but um okay it was meth <laughs> it was it was raw, <laughs> it was high grade raw it was high grade raw meth yeah <laughs> And he was he was trying to take just one capsule. He ended up taking twenty five of them. Like he he took his entire unit supply supply of it because he was trying to take he was trying to take it out while um, skiing. And obviously, <laughs> it's hard it's hard to get one thing one thing out of a container when you're wearing mitts. Especially yeah since yeah. This is Finland, and Finland is cold all the damn time. Yeah, so you just had to take them. Mm -hmm. And so I take them all. Yeah, he um, he had a he had a fair bit of hallucination incidents and hit and had a. There was one particular incident where he where um, he thought a he thought a soldier was was approaching him. He raised his rifle to shoot to shoot them. Oh crap! They remembered. They took away they took away my ammo because I'm on Pervitin. So he says, "Screw it," and just thro just throws his rifle at the guy. The guy explodes into snow. Wait, there's no guy there. He just, he's hallucinating. Damn. Oh. <laughs> Shortly thereafter, he and he ended up getting into a fight with a wolverine. Um, <laughs> and and only only to realize one, that's not a wolverine. That's a log. Two, I didn't stab him with my knife because they confiscated that. I stab I tried to stab him with my compass, and I just broke my damn compass. Or thinking that he found a a light that indicated a cabin or something, and in reality he was chasing the North Star. <laughs> ah, well, that wasn't that poetic. Um, uh, the f the fact that hit, that um, when he found the, when he found the cabin, he set up a fire, 
He said it in the wrong place, and then he then he woke up midway through napping to find the whole cabin on fire. So he just walked right outside and went right back to sleep. <laughs> while while the ca while the cabin is on fire, didn't even bother to try and put it out. And he had he had a resting heart rate that is tw that is twice the normal limit. The amount the it he should it should have killed him. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. He's he sur not only did he survive, he lived to old age. <laughs> yeah. Let well, let me tell you why this is a spine character because that's specifically what uh, in the full game there are going to be drugs, <laughs> and if you take too many of them, your character dies. Mm -hmm. Uh, straight up. And spine has one of the mechanics, uh, where it's like, it's just sort of like you can take another drug, you're fine, uh, and you can keep upgrading that trait until um. You're a bit of a monster. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that is... It's always fun to learn about crazy stuff that has happened in real life. Because that yeah. is... Man, that's so fun. And I bet that guy had a great time. Obviously, with these kind of stories, you do have to take them with a grain of salt because, uh, because of, um, of, how, of how selective hist historians can be. Well, the prob the problem here is that we is that norm is that we have to take it with a grain of salt because Imo himself doesn't trust his own account <laughs> because he was on fucking meth. Well, I mean, isn't it just more interesting to believe it? That's how I feel about it. About the small yeah. things in history, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's just more interesting if you believe that guy went through all that crazy shit. <laughs> yeah. And because it's it's always those sort of stories that are the ca the case of just stranger than fiction. Uh, yeah. And because and yet yes a fair a fair amount of the stories a fair amount of um, stories I do ha I do have on that front do t do tend to lean into the wi the Winter War if o if only because of some of the glorious stupidity that happened, like like say the Russians wearing gr wearing green uniforms because of how disorganized things were early on. Yeah. Uh It's it's a uh, it's a wacky time for military history. The Winter uh, War. Yeah. The, and of, though you can f you can find plenty of wackiness th throughout um, hi throughout history and especially throughout militaries, I've I have way too many stories that soldiers have to have told me of um, army people being stupid, or ju or just yeah or, or just pe or just people in ev in any branch being <laughs> be being being some being some variety of dumb or just um, design of cer design of certain things. I have a bit of a fondness for the infamous tank that was known as the Thing in the Vietnam War, where they they decided let's 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 um let's work with some farmers to to build a mint to build a tank that ha that is armed with like sit with like six recoilless rifles, but essentially six bazookas, and then and then tr try it and then then not like it, and then the Marines come in and say, "I'll take your whole stock." <laughs> and yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's that's a nice that's a nice thing to hear. Mm -hmm. The hard work paid off. The hard work the hard work paid paid off, and of of course the of course the these kind of these kind of stories can inform the craziness that you can get away with in in tabletop. And I, I will go into I will go into um, weird prototype weapons of the like and to see, okay, how can I make how can I turn this bad idea into something worse? I see. You know, like like taking an like taking an elephant gun and say, okay, he, okay, we have someone who's using an elephant gun, but it's semi-auto. <laughs> you know, or or the idea the idea of um. Of some of somebody who just take who took a howitzer and found a way to make it man portable. 
Yeah. I can't promise any experimental weapons. I can promise crazy stuff happening in the underground, but mm -hmm. a semi-automatic elephant gun, I just don't know how I would create that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> goes into the goes into the the realm of like I would rather just allow that to be someone's random made up thing that they can post online. Yeah, that's I've I just I just have a ha I've mentioned this many times in the past, but I have a habit of giving my players very powerful but very unsafe things and see what yeah. happens. Um like giving somebody the equivalent of the noisy cricket from Men in Black. <laughs> I am. Um, there's an underground item that is just a really big bomb, mm -hmm. and uh, I have yet to see it used because there's never been a situation where it would ever be safe to use it in any regard. Yeah. Now, when it comes to the core mechanic, you're using D12s and D6s. Uh, yeah. yeah. And unless I'm mistaken, the approach that you have is a rule of ten. If the sum is 10, you pass. If the sum is less than 10, you don't pass. Yeah. Oh, what pro what prompted this pr this particular approach? Uh so a lot of like synchro there's a lot of DNA in that decision. Um but I'm going to I'm going to say it like this. Um the idea was that uh, so it's kind of like in D and D when you when you roll to hit something and then you see how bad uh, you you you've hit it you know how hard you've hit it you roll damage. Mm -hmm. um, I've sort of taken that approach with like kind of everything you do. So that was kind of the idea. Um, I, I did away with the idea of things having like different uh like to hit targets because it what at a certain point the game was becoming too complicated because that because at that point you had HP and then you had the the damage resistance system which reduces the amount of damage you take uh so at that point you would have had that damage reduction and then uh HP and then you have to calculate what it takes to hit somebody with a weapon. And then it was like, well, you're picking a lock. What, what are you going to roll? You know? What, what are you going to roll to hit? And it's like 10. That's a fine number. So 10 was just used for everything. Um, and the idea behind that is the reason why you roll the hit is because there's fatigue in the game. Uh, you might have seen that. Mm -hmm. uh, when you get under 10... You just have to spend fatigue, and it and it treats it as if you rolled a ten, just just easily. So it's kind of it's kind of the room for error in like everything that we have as people, you know. Sometimes you drop your keys on the way to the door, hmm. you know, even though you've done it a million times. Yeah. Sometimes you just trip, you know. These kinds of, these kinds of things. That's what missing is. Like, just a complete failure that you kind of have to come back from for a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and then successes are... Because I wanted something that was, like... Because uh, I, I tried to avoid this thing where, like, you could really focus on, like, lockpicking, but, like, you could still just fail lockpicking. Uh, because, like, you just, you just rolled poorly. So that's what the multiple dice are for. Uh, granted, you can still just not do well, but if you have a high bonus in hand, which is what, like, lockpicking is associated with, and then, like, you're rolling six dice, super unlikely. You're going to be very dependable for that. So you've built your character to be super dependable. So it's all to facilitate when you want to be very good at something, you are very good at it. And even if you miss in the beginning, even with your big bonus that is making sure you get it to ten there's still a way to, like, come back from that with fatigue. Mm -hmm. Just in case, you know? Yeah, and... So. I... Th Personally, I'm, gl I'm glad to see it because D12s don't get enough love in the t in the tabletop world. Yeah, it, it was gonna be a D10, but, um... I decided that I hate it. 
and the and the whole game was rebuilt around having D12s instead of D10s. Because, I mean, like, damn. It's hard to roll those things. I mean, I've got I've gotten used I've gotten used to rolling them because because of all, because of all my years with percentile stuff, but mm. um more D, more D12s um I think sh I think should be tackled. But they're very nice. Mhm. Mm plus with plus with something like that, you can always you have a you have a very good pattern of cutting it down. Uh, cutting what down? You have a very good pattern of cu of cutting down the D12 into um, segments. Explain what you mean by that. Like it, like like being able to, because of the fact that it's that it's one through twelve, you ha you can use a D12 and and do two point seg and do two point segments if you if somebody wants to um, adjust the dice. That's that's kind of what I mean by that sort of thing. I see. I see. Yeah, that wasn't a part of the of the of the intention behind using the D12, but very. It is interesting that uh, there are other benefits to it. I guess. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. The thing about about that decision uh, to have the to have it then lead into D6s. Um, was sort was sort of because um, I I had just learned about a D six system at the time, and I thought it was super interesting compared to like the the normal dice uh, that I had used in other games. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really admi I really admire those systems. I haven't played a lot of them, but I really I played them like a f like a few times, and I'll, and never like a full campaign. But I, I really I really enjoy uh, the D six type stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, even even though the game is does not have a set um, setting, a set a set story, what have you, um, given how it's it's leaning to, it's leaning towards individual missions, do you plan on having something like a mission generator or or the like in the full book for the GM to utilize? Uh, yeah, that is. That's how the um. That's how most of the narrator's guide, which is just like if you could imagine, like the, the back half of the book, mm -hmm. you know, like the narrators only be on this point, sort of thing. Uh, you get there, and pretty much the whole thing is structured around the steps in creating a mission. Mm -hmm. Uh, because it's, as you would imagine, it's a really big part of the game. <laughs> uh, and I would like to have as much uh, information on that as possible. I want a lot of different options for them to use and, and like, play with and all. Mm -hmm. And I think the, I th the big, the big reason that I'd ask, that I'd ask on that is there's, a, is going episodic is, is definitely not as not it not going to be as high prep as say doing a full on campaign, so having the ability to come up with missions on the fly is certainly going to be fitting. Yeah, um, I I want to allow for people to have the big long campaign type stuff. I don't think it's very hard to do that. Mm -hmm. With with the underground, I think it's I think there's a very cool like bridge to gap there, um, but yeah, I, I, I'm kind of biased because this is um, it's kind of how I prefer to play when I run games, you know. Uh, I don't I don't do well with preparing a whole bunch of other stuff depending on like what they could do. Um, I'm very good at making like kind of curated experiences, I guess. Mm -hmm. Like when you get into this. Not that like you have to do each one of these things. Not like true railroading, but like I don't want to just. I, it's it's hard for me to just drop people in and be like, "What do you want to do?" Mm -hmm. You know, it's like here's your mission, here's where you are, and then you can just you can go however you want. And that's sort of the 
the approach I have when designing underground missions. And I, I have come to realize that there is one TV and film series that provides an almost perfect framework. Please share. I would, but this message will self-destruct in five seconds. Good luck. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%, 100%. Yeah, I actually haven't... Yeah, I actually haven't... Uh, seen as much Mission Impossible as I would like to. But yes, Mission Impossible is 100% a fantastic framework uh, for the underground. Yeah. Uh, even, even in so far as, like... You can just switch out, like, the system of, like, um, criminals, like in the John Wick style. You can just, like, switch it out to, like, oh, yeah, they're, like, the secret government agencies. Yeah. That's a system instead. Although, something, something when it comes to the appeal of the, of the criminals and assassins and the like within something like John Wick and this, and this, and I'm... I'm guessing if you would ever if you would ever run a John Wick style campaign, this is something you'd re you'd reinforce is that there is a very specific that being an assassin in that society has very specific rules that you have to follow, and there are consequences for breaking them. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Yeah, that's you know, that's like, a huge part. That's a huge part as well. There's there's a whole section that I've written in the in the narrator's uh, part. That's like, don't, like, like tell your players the rules, mm -hmm. but like also, like kind of encourage them to break them, <laughs> like a like a little bit, um, like be subtle with it, cause, cause there are like rules in the system that that work with the rules of the game, mm -hmm. like one of them is is this thing of like you when you have a when you find a weapon. Uh, during a mission, you can't bring that back to the lair, and by consequence, can't bring that on like future missions. Mm -hmm. Which is just there because, like, I want um, a machine gun is like uh, a mid-game weapon, for example. But like, if you're in early game, you, the narrator might want to use a machine gun for an enemy, and maybe allow their characters to their players to use it. But like, don't want to break the game by allowing them to bring the machine gun back. Mm -hmm. You know. That sort of thing, but also they can bring the sh the machine gun back. They're just like breaking the rules. They're just they're just breaking the rules of that. So, I encourage using those rules to both reinforce the game. Uh, but of course, there's also those rules of like don't kill people in this hotel or something like that. You know, the whole no business in the continental. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually had um, I I, I was doing a play test mission where I, I basically copied that. Uh, thing, hmm. um, and the hotel got like deconsecrated in the middle of the mission. So like there was a big part of the map that was like this is uh, extreme terrain, which is like you know difficult terrain equivalent because there's just a bunch of agents here killing each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was very fun in that regard. Yeah. Now, one of the big things on on the mechanics end is the trump card. Yes, it is. Yep. So, the way that the way that I saw it with what I was reading is that the trump card is a, is a, is a kind of extra effort type of mechanic, which is which I use as a catch all whenever I see this kind of thing in game of a limited resource that you can sort of use to turn the tide in in a scene. Um. Again, um, in World of Darkness, it's the willpower points. In yes, um, yeah. In Shadowrun, it's Edge. In um, Eclipse Phase, it's Moxie. That ki that kind of thing. And obviously, uh, I'm not expecting trump card points, but it's in that same ballpark. Yeah, it would be close to hero points and mutants and masterminds. That kind of stuff. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Um. I thought of it as like uh. I mean, I, it's weird because trump card feels like such the perf. It feels like the perfect term for it. Uh, mm -hmm. but it feels like, um, like the ultimate ability kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, to an extent, because, like, the basic use for the trump card is, like, oh, you just make a, a hit into a critical hit, which is nice, you know, pretty good, but not, like, the, the end of it. The, the later uses of, like, getting specific abilities and being, like, yeah, I'm doing max damage on you for this attack, uh, that's sort of the, 
the allure of of trump cards like just mm-hmm. super powerful uh abilities um i don't remember all of them that are on the the quick start the over the table edition um i i remember them i remember that they're good i remember that they're pretty strong trump card abilities yeah for I, most of them um there's one there's one in mus- in muscle called maximum pain um, yep. Which reads after after hitting an enemy with an attack roll, the character counts damage by treating every damage die as if they rolled a six, but determining successes and other values by the number on the die are unchanged. Yeah, that it was to prevent uh, major jank. Mm-hmm. That that last part, but the but, but the main focus is that you you count everything as a six for damage, mm-hmm. which ends up amounting to a lot. Mm-hmm. So yeah, they're, they're, they're oh, go, oh, go ahead. They're fun. I was going to say they're very fun things. Uh, what were you going to ask? Um, some of them I did. I did notice you have fatigue, so I would. I did want to dip into how you handle fatigue mechanics. Okay. Um, yeah, fatigue is. Um, it's much. It's much more basic. Uh, fatigue is kind of like the the bedrock on which the the mechanics lie because the, the the narrator point of view is that you're trying to make the the players spend all their fatigue um that means fatigue has to do good things so there's a lot of uses for them at base they increase your initiative in combat they make you move an extra 10 feet during movement they make you hit they roll extra dice that kind of stuff um they're also just how like things are balanced in terms of uh, a bit in terms of abilities, you know. Um, none of them do crazy stuff, uh, fatigue, but they're all they're all pretty useful for the for the bonuses they have. Um, I'm not sure what specifically you want to know about about how they're used, but they're yeah. a pretty broad resource. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's more it's more of it's more of how it how it ends up getting used because. Fatigue in RPGs is a ve- is a very broad concept. There's there's yeah. some that use it essentially as a way as a way to introduce MP without actually having MP, and there's and there's some that um, have it as as more of a t- taking a bigger risk kind of approach. And there's plenty of exceptions in just those two examples alone. Yeah, I'm not sure if I. Uh... Either of those two fit how fatigue is used, because mm-hmm. I don't imagine it as like an extra effort kind of thing. I imagine it as like these are just like in in my mind, you're just gonna be tired or like there's only so much you can do in one mission, and this is how we track um how tired you're getting by the end of it, you know mm-hmm. and of course, you can't use more. By the time you use all of your fatigue, but yeah, obvi- obviously. Now, with the with that in mind, I know th- I know that you're you had put you had also put in a um a sample mission, and I'm cu- I'm curious if in the full book you'll have a short you'll have a, a short little collection of of sample missions along with associated NPCs. Uh, missions are, are a lot harder. Um, I might throw in, like, one sample mission in the, in the full version. Um, but I, but I've found that, uh, actually making missions, because that, because the one that is, that is currently the sample mission out there was kind of like the last one that I could make. Mm Mm-hmm. Like there were a few other missions that I made and then got chopped off. It just didn't work out, cause uh, they were just like too complicated for how much budget I had and how much uh, you needed to do. There was like you know the basic mission. This is what you do for your first mission, the underground. It's like very simple. How you get a hold of it. And pretty much everything I was thinking of initially had like complicated stuff coming up, uh, so we end up with this one. Um, 
But that being said, I don't know if the base game is going to have a mission. I might focus all the all the time and energy onto really clear directions on crafting a mission and making that really strong. Mm-hmm. I could, um, which is, I could certainly see that. It's just a matter of like time and and, and resources. At the end of the day. Uh, Making missions is one of the stretch goals um, on the on the Kickstarter page mm -hmm. uh, because and it's because I know that that all costs extra. You know the creation of NPCs and all that. Um, there's going to be a an enemy list though mm -hmm. of NPCs. There are definitely going to be NPCs that you can kind of switch around. So there's going to be that at, at least. And. Given that, given that, given that, um, when it comes to the NPC, when it comes to the NPC list, I'm guessing you're going to be doing it across different tiers instead, instead of a bunch, instead of a bunch of entry levels or something like that. Yeah, a bunch of a bunch of tiers. Um, there's going to be enemies that you're going to put in like early game, mid game, late game, depending on on what interaction they're going to have with the players that kind of stuff there's going to be i think the goal is to have four legendary npcs statted out uh which are just you know really powerful in universe super strong agents very hard to beat which i i don't even know how they would fit into a mission that well just because they're so strong i've already made i've already made one um, which might not have been the best use of my time, but I just wanted to. Um, and that... I mean, it'll be fun. It'll be fun to try and beat and beat these things. I like having fun little challenges, kind of like uh, the way Atom Smasher is used in like Cyberpunk, in the Cyberpunk games. Mm -hmm. And Much closer. Yeah. Now, with, the, with that in mind... Um, what are you shooting for as far as a page, as far as a total page count? Um, 150 to 200. And I, I can, I can see that given how this is a significantly lighter affair than, than some other entries. And as far as far as a rele a release window, are you th are you thinking um, early next year or something like that? Uh, after funding is complete, uh, it's going to be four to six months uh, after. Um, well, no, because a part of this is that I have to finish uh, the current college semester. So yeah, it's being complete December. So about four months after that, uh, upon funding, is the goal of releasing the underground. Mm -hmm. And I will, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. It's 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 been a pleasure. Thank you for for having me. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then... On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!